Hello, good afternoon. I'm April Ferris, and I'm the president of the Houston Lawyers Chapter of the Federalist Society. I'd like to welcome you all to our Zoom dialogue on the future of originalism. I'd like to thank the Austin Lawyers Chapter for co-hosting with us, and also special thanks to Judge Oldham for moderating our discussion. Before we begin our discussion, I'll begin with a few brief instructions. The audience will be muted for today's event, but beginning at 12.45 p.m., we will open the floor for question and answer. If you're dialing in today, you can ask a question by pressing star nine on your phone. If you're joining us by Zoom, you can click on the hand icon uh, to raise your hand and ask a question. Also, you can submit a written question using the chat function, and that function will be open later during today's program. With that, I'll turn to our presentation. Our moderator today is Judge Andrew Oldham. Judge Oldham was confirmed to the Fifth Circuit in 2018. Before ascending to the bench, Judge Oldham served as general counsel to Texas Governor Greg Abbott, where he advised the governor on a range of issues under federal and state law. He also managed litigation in which the governor was an interested party. Before that, he served as Deputy Solicitor General for the state of Texas, where he represented Texas in federal courts across the country, including twice before the United States Supreme Court. Before entering private practice, Judge Oldham served as a law clerk to Justice Samuel Alito at the U.S. Supreme Court of the United States and to Judge David Sintel of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. He also worked as an attorney advisor in the Office of Legal Counsel at the U.S. Department of Justice from 2006 to 2008. Judge Oldham earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia with highest honors. He then attended Cambridge University, where he earned his master's in philosophy, and he also graduated magna cum laude from Harvard Law School. Welcome, Judge Oldham. Thank you very much, April, and to the Houston chapter and also to the Austin chapter um, of the Federalist Society. It's a great privilege, a great honor to be here to talk about a very exciting topic and one, that no, one I know um, has been um, hotly debated and hot, hotly uh, written about in lots of different corners. And I hope that today's dialogue um, will provide a useful contribution um, to that conversation. We have three amazing panelists, another credit um, to the Federal Society in organizing this event. Um, our first speaker today um, is Alon Worman, who is a visiting assistant professor and incoming associate professor at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law, where he teaches administrative law and constitutional law. He writes on administrative law, separation of powers and constitutionalism, and his academic writing has appeared or is forthcoming in the Yale Law Journal, the Stanford Law Review, the University of Chicago Law Review, the University of Pennsylvania Law Review, the Duke Law Journal, and the Texas Law Review, among other journals. He's also the author of the book, A Debt Against the Living, an introduction to originalism by Cambridge University Press in 2017, and the forthcoming book, The Second Founding, an introduction to the 14th Amendment, also by Cambridge um, forthcoming. Um, Alan was a law clerk to my wonderful and esteemed colleague, Judge Jerry Smith, um, in 2013 and 2014. Um, our second speaker today um, will be Josh Hammer. He is an opinion editor of Newsweek, a syndicated columnist of counsel at First Liberty Institute, a Blaze TV contributor, and a campus speaker through Young America's Foundation and the Federalist Society. Josh previously worked at Kirkland and Ellis LLP, and he clerked for another of my wonderful and esteemed colleagues, Judge James C. Ho, um, on the Fifth Circuit. Um, Josh has also served as a John Marshall Fellow with the Claremont Institute and as a law clerk for Senator Mike Lee of Utah. Uh, his first piece of legal scholarship on the topic of judicial supremacy was published in 2020 by the University of St. Thomas, I'm sorry, the, the University of St. Thomas Law Journal. He's also been published by many other uh, leading lay outlets, including the Los Angeles Times, the New York Post, National Review, First Things, Fortune Magazine, Fox Business, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, the Jewish Journal, and the American Mind. Um, Josh graduated from Duke University, where he majored in economics, and the University of Chicago Law School. Last but certainly not least um, is Frank Buckley, who is a foundation professor at Scalia Law School. His most recent book is American Secession, The Looming Threat of a National Breakup, um, published this year in 2020. His next book, Curiosity, will be published by Encounter Books next year in 2021. So with that, we'll turn it over to our panelists. Our format for today, um, much like many of our in-person Federal Society panels, is each um, presenter will speak for about 10 minutes. Um, I'll give them a warning with about a minute to go. Um, then I'll ask a few questions um, of the panel to hopefully um, create a certain dialogue. And then we will open up uh, to the audience. So without further ado, 
Professor Warman. Uh, thanks so much. Um, thanks to everyone for hosting this event uh, and including me in it. Uh, my 10 minutes of remarks will uh, be loosely based on my book, A Debt Against the Living, Introduction to Originalism, which I was pleased to present to the Houston Federalist Society two or three years ago. Uh, but the thrust of my remarks today will be the connection of originalism to the common good. And I'd like to establish that connection in two steps. The first step is a bit, is a bit easier than the second step. The first question is to ask, what is the role of legal texts in our legal system as a general matter, especially public legal texts like statutes, treaties, and constitutions? The answer, I submit, is that they are instructions, public instructions, either to us, to our legal officials, or both. As such, they're interpreted the same way any communication intended as a public instruction is interpreted with its original public meaning. Put another way, statutes, treaties, and constitutions are not Socratic dialogues. We don't interpret them esoterically. They aren't poems or novels either. And they aren't secret instructions conveyed by military code talkers. They're public instructions. So we interpret them with their public meaning just like you'd interpret a fried chicken recipe from 1789 with its public meaning, to borrow an analogy from Professor Gary Lawson. This also means that we interpret these instructions with their original meaning, because that's the meaning the authors intended to convey. Right? And so only the original meaning conveys the actual instruction. Now, this point seems so obvious to me, but for some reason, maybe it's not too surprising, some people, especially Many academics have a difficulty grasping this point. So I want to explain why the contemporary public meeting doesn't work as a method of interpretation. There are only, I think, two ways in which the contemporary meaning will diverge from the original meaning. Okay, the first way is linguistic or semantic drift. So today, to take a prominent example, Domestic violence means spousal abuse, whereas in the Constitution, it refers to insurrection. Surely the domestic violence clause does not today authorize federal legislation against spousal abuse. And I'm putting aside the 14th Amendment for purposes of, of this discussion. The point is, it would be crazy to allow accidental drifts in language to determine the content of our laws. No political theory that I know of anyway uh, would justify letting linguistic drift determine legal content. If it did, right, if, if accidental shifts in language determine the content of our law, then we would quite literally be living in a system of accident and force rather than reflection and choice. The only other way that original meaning might diverge from public meaning is if intervening actors have convinced us that the language should be interpreted differently. And so we, the people today, see the language through that intervention. Let me take the Sixth Amendment as an example. To the modern ear, having the right to counsel sounds as though it means the government has to pay for your lawyer. But that only sounds right to us because for 60 years, we've been told by the Supreme Court that that's what it, that that's what it means. And so it sounds plausible, but of course, it's actually totally implausible. Apply that logic to the First or Second Amendments. Do you have a right to a government-supplied firearm? To a taxpayer-subsidized New York Times? Of course not. We only interpret the Sixth Amendment differently. We only hear it differently because intervening political actors, judges, who are supposed to be controlled by the Constitution, decided at some point to change the law of the Constitution rather than be controlled by it. Okay, so that's the first thing I wanted to say. These are legal instructions and we interpret them with their original public means. But that leaves the much bigger second question, the second step of the analysis. Are we bound to the particular legal instructions in our legal system? In other words, yes, we may interpret statutes as a general matter with their original public meanings because they're instructions to us and our legal officials, but we only do that because we're bound to them, because we're bound to those statutes, right? 
only being bound explains why we follow even the bad statutes, right? Only being bound explains why we follow even the bad statutes that Congress enact. So in our system, we recognize in the case of statutes that the democratic process through which statutes are enacted confers legitimacy on those laws such that they are binding, all of them, even those we don't like. In other words, whether statutes are binding is a question mostly separate from the question of what those statutes as instructions actually command or direct. Well, what about the Constitution? What makes a Constitution legitimate and therefore binding? It may not be the same thing that makes a statute binding, that makes ordinary law binding. Well, in my book, I argue that what makes a constitution legitimate and therefore binding, even in the face of disagreement over its particulars, is a threshold success in balancing self-government on the one hand, allowing people to band together to legislate for the common good, and liberty on the other. These two objectives, however, are in tension we all know it's often popular majorities that infringe on the rights of minorities. The framers were very cognizant of history, history which included numerous attempts at creating a common good that ultimately ended in tyranny. So they sought to frame a constitution that successfully balances not only self-government, but also liberty, a balance that is extraordinarily difficult to achieve. My claim is that the framers were remarkably successful for their time at creating a constitution that balanced these competing objectives through ingenious mechanisms, the separation of powers, checks and balances, the enumeration of power, the bill of rights, the representative mechanism itself, all were novelties. But more importantly than that, the framers, I submit, wrote the constitution in such a way that it would continue to strike a successful balance between self-government and individual liberty long into the future on both sides of the equation. On the liberty side, the rights protecting provisions of the Constitution are written in sufficiently broad terms so that their fixed meanings can and do apply to new and changing circumstances. We all know this, hence the First Amendment applies to speech on the internet, the Fourth Amendment applies to GPS devices that police officers put on cars, right? Well, on the self-government side of the equation, Consider what the Constitution insulates from democratic politics, from politics in the pursuit of the common good. Not much, very little. It insulates those liberties, those rights most essential to free societies, like free speech, press, religion, assembly, petition, self-preservation rights in the Second Amendment, and due process rights. Other than that, the Constitution leaves most other things to the democratic process precisely because the founders expected we would pursue the common good and evolve and progress over time. Therefore, so long as we the people today, okay, here and now, not as a matter of blind veneration to the founders, to the past, but today, continue to believe, agree and accept that the constitution of our founders, as it's been properly amended, of course, continues to strike a successful balance between self-government or the pursuit of the common good and liberty, then that constitution I submit to you all is legitimate and therefore binding as a whole, whatever its imperfections. Because the point is important, I'm going to try to restate it one more time in a slightly different way. There must be something that makes a constitution legitimate and therefore binding. Right? It can't possibly be that no constitution is ever binding. We know that can't possibly be true. It's never been true. Society would fall apart. Okay? But on the other hand, it can't possibly be that a constitution is binding only if it says exactly what you personally would want it to say, were you the sole drafter. There must be a middle ground, something that makes a constitution legitimate, even in the face of disagreement over its particulars. I claim that that middle ground is this threshold success in balancing self-government and liberty, even if it's not the exact balance you would strike. So to conclude the argument, if the constitution is legitimate and therefore binding, we interpret it, all of it, as we interpret any other binding legal instruction, including those particular statutes we don't like. 
namely with its original public meaning. So what, again, is the connection between originalism and the common good? Well, as should now be clear, the Constitution is a balancing act. It is a balancing act between the pursuit of the common good on the one hand and preserving liberty as a protective measure against the many previous attempts at achieving the common good that have ended in majority tyranny. Our Constitution is a balance between the two and only originalism preserves that balance. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Alon, for those, those remarks. Um, next, we'll hear um, from Josh Hammer. Uh, thank you, Judge Oldham, so much. Thank you, Houston Lawyers Chapter, Austin Lawyers Chapter. Two of my very favorite Lawyers Chapters. I'm obviously a partisan of the Dallas Lawyers Chapter, but uh, definitely a huge fan of our fellow Texas chapters. Um, so this is obviously kind of the hot discussion in originalism, in legal scholarship, legal commentary circles right now. So it's truly a pleasure and honor to, uh, to, be, to be a part of this. You know, I, I'll start off just by saying I obviously echo and agree with uh, the overwhelming majority of what Alon has said. I mean, the basic claim of originalism uh, seems almost too axiomatic, seems too self-evident to bother to repeat. Um, I mean, when you look at a legal text, if you were to ask a kindergartner or a first grader or a second grader, how would you try to understand a text, a document that you were trying to read? I think even someone of that age would be able to fairly easily and readily intuit that the proper way to do so is to try to divine what was tr meant to be conveyed by the people who wrote that document. It is not a particularly outlandish claim, it is a fairly simple claim. Um, and the, uh, the, the interpretive, the hermeneutical truth therein, I have yet to see effectively rebutted by some of these other emerging schools of thought. But, I want to take a step back here and just kind of talk about what is, you know, the elephant in the room and someone's name who hasn't been mentioned yet, with, which, of course, is my friend Adrian Vermeule. And Adrian, you know, Adrian, of course, is the reason why we're all here. Uh, you know, I, I know some people perhaps rather not uh, say his name or uh, perhaps it's kind of like Lord Baltimore to some of these, it's, it's, some, it's some of our circles. But um, Adrian is a friend. And I, you know, I remember uh, I spoke at Harvard FedSoc back in March. We got coffee for about an hour and a half afterwards. And he told me about this essay he was writing. And I was very excited for it. Um, so here's what I want to say to people who are on this webinar right now. This is kind of the ultimate message that I want to convey. Adrian is onto something. And the, he's, he's onto something for reasons that I'll explain in, in just a couple of minutes. But the response from people who are on this webinar, who are on this Zoom, who care about the Federal Society, who care about originalism, who care about the normative value of the U.S. Constitution, the response is twofold. One is to kind of just brush it aside and say, oh, he's, you know, a crazy uh, curmudgeon up in Harvard and he's not going to get any acolytes and no one's going to follow him. Or we can take seriously his arguments, try to incorporate some of what he's saying perhaps into our arguments and then attempt to convey a substantive message that might win over young lawyers and law students anew. And, you know, I, I think the value add that I bring to this panel, I'm obviously, um, unlike Frank and Alon, I'm not an academic, but I do kind of dabble in the realm of, you know, a general political observance and commentary, and I kind of live in the conservative world more broadly. So I, I, I think, and I, and I discussed this a little bit in my response to Adrian, an essay that I called Common Good Originalism at Claremont's American Mind website. But I think it's important to contextualize this discussion within the broader range of what is going on in the conservative world. You know, in 2016, when President Trump was elected, he obviously was a wrecking ball of all wrecking balls. Um, destroying with him many scler sclerotic, outmoded orthodoxies and uh, consensus that many people perhaps thought were uh, indestructible, but nonetheless proved more easily destructible than they perhaps thought they'd be. Um, but in the wake of that, there's been all of these obviously competing strands of people trying to claim the mantle of the, of the so-called new right, of what a forward-looking conservatism looks like going forward. And this is the context for uh, the uh, now infamous debates last year between David French, who at the time he was National Review, now writes for the Dispatch, versus uh, Sorab Amari of the New York Post. Kind of uh, on, on the former hand, you have this more kind of classical, liberal, individual rights centric approach to politics and law as discrete disciplines, uh, versus a more common good, justice oriented approach on the latter hand. And that is the context in which Adrian has delivered this message to us, what he calls common good constitutionalism, an unabashed, uh, substantive, moralistic reading of the document, uh, 
Um, and again, I don't find it truly compelling for a lot of the reasons that Elon has outlined. It just seems so, so obvious to me that the original meaning of any text, whether it's a contract or a constitution or statute or regulation, any legal text, um, it seems to me that to have some sort of exegetical legitimacy must have some relation to the original meaning and what it meant to people who ratified that document. But what we should do in response to Adrian, I would contend, is to seriously grapple and wrestle with these ideas. And my basic claim is essentially as follows. A lot of originalism and originalist discourse, I think, has gotten completely unmoored over the last 15, 20 years. If you look back to kind of what animated the founding of the Federal Society in, in, in the early 1980s, of course, um, it was opposition, of course, to, to, to Roe and Griswold and a lot of these um, aggressively activist, um, socially liberalizing, individual autonomy, maximizing decisions, you know, and, and related to the social conservative culture war issues, I think back to uh, Ed Meese, Ronald Reagan's attorney general, when Ed Meese was asked repeatedly when he was serving as Ronald Reagan's attorney general, if, if Ed had one case to overturn, what would it be? He always said Miranda versus Arizona, actually. So not a culture war issue per se, but a law enforcement issue. But my, in my contention is someone who has been, who was kind of grown up, so to speak, in federal society world. I, I was a three-year board member uh, at UChicago Law, obviously a founding uh, chapter of the federal society and the campus speaker today. We have really gotten untethered from our moralistic roots. Um, I think we have been co-opted by a strident strand of aggressive indiv individual autonomy max maximizing libertarianism um, that talks about gutting the administrative state as, as a goal of all goals, that talks about a lot of uh, making allies with the cultural left on a lot of culture war causes that the original founding generation of federal society, the Eagle Eagles, would have held dear. Um, and I think we need to kind of return a little bit more to our roots. And those roots, by the way, that's not a crazy claim. You know, if you look at the preamble of the U.S. Constitution, if you look at the substantive normative reasons that the framers told us they were drafting and, and ultimately ratifying this constitution. They, they told us right there in the preamble. And you can, you can read it for yourself, but pretty much all of those, with the possible exception of securing the blessings of liberty, liberty, by the way, being a word that to modern kind of licentious oriented ears means nothing whatsoever to what it meant to the founders. But per, per, per holding that, that uh, blessing of liberty perhaps aside, all of the other substantive criteria enumerated in the preamble uh, providing for the common defense, promoting the general welfare, establishing justice. These are Aristotelian moralistic claims. So our constitution, I think, as constructed, is inherently a common good constitution. And this, of course, makes sense if you think about, um, in particular, uh, John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, James Wilson, John Marshall. These were all kind of early founding era luminaries who intuited um, as Edmund Burke himself actually intuited, that the American constitutional order was best understood, not as a radical uh, Tom Paine, Jeffersonian, French revolutionary, uh, radical experiment in Western constitutional self-governance theory, but as a restoration of the English constitution that a monarch and a parliament gone rogue had essentially uh, neglected to, um, uh, to afford the protections of for the colonists. Um, and that common good tradition does go back to English common law. And what I outlined in my essay response to Adrian, and what I'm going to eventually um, flesh out a little more when I have time to do so, is I think we need to really rediscover that common good oriented, common law centric constitutional jurisprudence. And I, you, you know, I, I, I'm not going to pick too much on uh, the Federal Society because I obviously love the Federal Society. I'm a proud member today, and we're on this webinar together. But something is like as just as symbolic as the fact that James Madison himself is the silhouette for our organization. Um, I have a bone to pick with that. As I said in my essay, I think that Alexander Hamilton and that kind of John Marshall Hamiltonian, more Anglophilic tradition actually is our true conservative originalist inheritance today. And I talk about McCullough versus Maryland um, as being a necessary and proper clause, concrete example of how a more expansive constructionism was actually the true conservative, uh, common law centric constitutional inheritance as opposed to kind of the strict constructionism of Jefferson and Madison. But these are all kind of getting in the weeds perhaps a little too much for purposes of this call. The broader claim and one that I really want to get back to and emphasize is I would just encourage everyone listening to think about what Professor Vermeule has written. Um, and we need to contextualize this, of course, um, in the context of the looming decisions from the Supreme Court on Title VII, which is what is kind of lurking in the background here all along. 
There's a lot of rumor mongering. A lot of people seem to fear that um, Justice Gorsuch perhaps might um, side with the liberal bloc in the Title VII case, which technically is a statutory case, the textualism case, non-originalism case. But the broader claim of people like me and, and, like, and like how the archivist has written this any number of times is that when originalism gets so bogged down in a positivistic approach to the law qua law, when we talk about um, not staring at the moral truths that lay there beneath the text, I don't think we're actually doing originalism right. Because originalism, as it was understood by the founding generation, was not a purely positivistic legal interpretive enterprise. It entailed substance. And I think the originalism that we need to, that we need to promote moving forward, um, that will not just kind of fit with the broader conservative movement zeitgeist of so-called common good conservatism, but is also the actual, as a historical fact, our true inheritance, what we actually took from the uh, English common law tradition and what prevailed at the American founding as seen in the jurisprudence of John Marshall and indeed Justice Story, is a common good centric moralistic constitutional interpretation that did not shy away from staring at the moral truths that lay beneath the text. And I would just encourage everyone on this call to think very hard about that and to just try to shy away from pure positivism, pure qua positivism. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, um, Josh, for those wonderful comments. Um, I think we're having some, some technical difficulties with Frank Buckley. We're going to try to get him back. In the meantime, I'm curious, Alon, if you have um, any responses to, to what Josh had to say. Yeah, well, it would be a poor sportsmanship if I didn't agree with most of what he said, since he agreed with most of what I said. Uh, so I'll say, you know, I, I agree with a lot of, of, of what you say, Josh, uh, though I'm, I'm skeptical um, uh, that it has to do with constitutional interpretation uh, so much as politics, right? Uh, you know, the economy versus common good and so on. But because we have Frank back, uh, how about I say the rest of the moment uh, for after? Well, yeah, thank you very much, guys. I apologize for that. I blame Comcast. Um, and my apologies in particular to Josh Hammer. I'm sure what he said was absolutely brilliant and that I'd have no answer for it whatsoever. But, you know, as I didn't hear him, I don't have to respond to him, right? And I also thank everybody for letting me in because I'm very much the interloper. I'm not the con lawyer that everybody else here is. Uh, I'm a private lawyer. And indeed, the only con law I ever took was... Uh, uh, the British North America Act in Canada. So I'm very much the outsider. But as an outsider, I looked at the arguments for originalism. And whilst I was uh, very sympathetic to, I think, their objective politically, yet I found the arguments really quite unpersuasive. And let me try to tell you why. Um, so what are the arguments for originalism? Firstly, the argument from certainty, right? So it goes like this. What you've got is the fixed star of the framers constitution versus a big bowl of shapeless jelly in which uh, Judge Andrew Oldham and other judges play. And uh, I don't buy that for a couple of reasons. One is, let me state this right off. Uh, I like the idea of reversibility. I like the idea, I'm a bit of a Hayekian. So I think that experience should really be our guide and in that, I'm quoting John Dickinson at the convention. Um, Dickinson was a Hayekian of la Lettre, and uh, I think people there would have agreed with him. And, you know, if that's the case, originalism wouldn't unwind of itself. And then apart from that, you have the illusion that originalism offers greater certainty. Now, I didn't hear Josh, but I had the sense that there was a disagreement between Josh and Elan. And if that's the case, so much for certainty from originalism. But, but even apart from that, right, Zephyr Teachout thinks that Citizens United was wrongly decided. Zephyr Teachout is an originalist. Bruce Fine thinks that every war we entered into in the last 60 years was illegal. Bruce Fine is an originalist. Roger Pilon is a libertarian, like most folks at Cato. Roger is an originalist, right? So if originalism means all those very different things, it really doesn't mean very much at all. Secondly, and here I'll, I'll, I'll respond to something that, that Elan was talking about, that we're bound to the Constitution because it strikes a proper balance between self-government and liberty, to which I'd say nonsense. 
That's not why I'm bound. I actually don't think the American Constitution does that. I think the Anglo-Canadian system of parliamentary democracy does so much, much better. But all that's irrelevant because the reason why I'm bound to the Constitution is because I took an oath of citizenship. I did it on tax day, April 15, 2014. That made me a citizen, whatever I thought about the Constitution. Um, so it seems to me that Elan has tried to give um, jurisdiction and citizenship a weight that they can't bear. If, if Elan became a Venezuelan or a Russian, he'd be bound to support their constitution. Um, I think Hannah Arendt had it right. You're, you're bound unless the constitution is so immoral that you have a right of revolt, as, for example, the fugitive slaves did when they fled to the freer countries of Mexico and Canada before the Civil War. Then you have the idea of the normative superiority of the Constitution. Right. Well, but what Constitution, firstly, are we talking about? I mean, I mean, there's so many of them I've seen so far. But even if what we're talking about is Roger Pilon's libertarian Constitution, uh, I don't buy that either. Uh, I'll tell you wh why. I mean, if, if you're bound because of the normative superiority of the Constitution, what do you do about the Fugitive Slave Clause and the Fugitive Slave Acts before the Civil War, right? What exactly is the status of the framers between 1789 and 1865, right? Are, are they simply uh, chopped liver? I, I, I don't buy it. Secondly, and here I draw on my experience from Canada, I rather like the idea of uh, you know, a living constitution if it departs from the original text in a way which promotes liberty, as the Privy Council did in a Canadian decision involving federalism. Uh, the, the founders of Canada, the fathers of Confederation, wanted a very centralizing document. The Privy Council took a look at that and, and said, right, uh, we, we actually like decentralization. And as it's the case, I believe that Canada is much more a robust federal state than America, I rather like what the Privy Council did in that respect. And then let me mention one last thing, uh, the incorporation doctrine. It seems to me if you're originalist, you must be opposed to the incorporation doctrine. Curiously, however, some prominent originalists also object to the Blaine Amendments. I don't think you can do that. I don't think you can suck and blow at the same time, right? The, the, the thing which really gets me about originalism, however, is, is what seems to me to be their hubris. I mean, the idea is, I, I guess I'm here speaking not so much to Elan as I am to people like uh, Roger Pilon, right? The idea is if we can't win dem democratically, we'll do it constitutionally, right? I mean, that's never going to persuade your opponents. It won't persuade me because I'm not an originalist, right? But observe how much that resembles the undemocratic li liberal clerisy now atop uh, our academic legal institutions, right? What that kind of originalist would want to do is replace one elite with another. He doesn't object to the means. He just wants to be able to run things his own way. The counter-majoritarian problem is the same. Constitutional laws, I see it, should be divorced from politics. A colleague of mine once in a debate told me that he preferred the American Constitution to the Canadian one because uh, there is a scheme of Medicare in Canada and not in the United States. Well, even leaving aside the fact that I prefer the socialized system of medicine in Canada to the socialized system of medicine in the United States, I don't think that's how you do constitutional law. I suspect I agree with Elon here, right? I think what you do is you set the thing in motion and then you're rather agnostic about how things turn out, whether it's for or against Medicare. So constitutional law, as I see it, should be divorced from politics. That is to say, I'm not an originalist. Um, there's another question here about which constitution um, public meaning and original intent. I'd argue for original intent, but uh, I think it'd be better actually to stop right now and get into discussion.
That's wonderful. Well, thank you very much, um, Frank, for, for your remarks and for getting back um, so quickly. It's um, a wonderful contribution um, to the conversation and, and to, to Josh, obviously, some of the things that you might think um, don't merit discussion about original public meaning originalism obviously do. So, so we, we can um, continue that conversation um, with, with Frank's healthy skepticism, I think. But why don't we start with something that I think all three of you brought up, which is this notion of why are we bound? Um, so Alon, you, you talked about that. Josh, I know that in your back and forth with Professor Van Yule, um, you talked about that. And obviously Frank has a, has a third view. So why don't we just go in order um, Alon, Josh, and Frank about and respond to, to one another or to Professor Vermeule on the so-called oath-taking problem um, about the Constitution and, and, and its legitimacy for binding us. Yeah, uh, thanks uh, for those uh, remarks, Frank. Now we've got ourselves a debate. Uh, <laughs> and um, so I have five points in response, two of which relate to Judge Oldham's prompting. Uh, so I'll start, I'll start with those. You say you're bound by the oath. Okay, so be it. Uh, there are lots of uh, scholars, and I think I saw Christopher Green, Professor Green at Ole Miss on this call. Um, uh, he has an argument about the oath clause uh, creating uh, this, you know, what are you taking the oath to this constitution and what does that imply? Well, all the sorts of things I said about public construction. So if you're bound for that reason, then, then fine, then you should be an originalist when it comes to interpreting the constitution, right? Uh, which sort of brings me, uh, you know, to the, to the, Actually, I guess I have three points. So, so it brings me to another question, which you said, you know, originalism isn't the only system that has certainty. I agree with that. I agree with your point about this. The common law constitution can have certainty. Judicial opinions create certainty. A judicial opinion written by a non-originalist judge is interpreted how? Well, with its original public meaning. The point is some legal text purports to create our legal obligations that we're supposed to be bound by, and how do we figure out what it requires of us? We interpret it with its original public meaning. The question is, are we bound by the original public meaning of judicial opinions? Do judges get to make the law, or are we bound by the original public meaning of what we the people enact into law, whether in statutes or the Constitution? None of that assails the proposition that original public meaning is how we interpret these texts. It goes to the question of, what is the legitimate source of law and legal obligation in our system? Do judges get to make it up and thereby, and therefore we're bound by the original public meaning of their opinions, or are we bound to something else? And I think we're bound to something else. So which brings me to the third point I want to make, which I touched on this legitimacy questions, this binding questions. You raise the very, the very, you know, problematic example of the fugitive slave clause and, you know, the, the accommodation with slavery. And I'll say two things in response to this, because it's a common criticism and we've heard a lot about this in the 1619 Project now. Well, the first thing I'll say, you'll note that I didn't say that we're only bound by the Constitution today. If the Constitution of 1789 or 1791 was legitimate in the sense that we believe it needs to be. I said, if we the people today believe that this Constitution balances self-government and liberty, then we're bound even in the face of disagreement. And lo and behold, our constitution no longer has the fugitive slave clause. It no longer has the three-fifths clause, right? Because we progressed and evolved over time. We realized that this precondition, the self-government and liberty today, uh, as we understand it today, was insufficiently met by the old constitution. And so we carried the constitution along with us. We progressed, but we brought the constitution along with us. And the only thing I'll say, uh, the other point about this, is we have to be wary of what the admittedly socialist historian E.P. Thompson famously described as the enormous condescension of posterity, okay? It's very easy to sit from our modern day perch and criticize the founders for all of these accommodations they had to make with slavery. But what was the alternative? What was the alternative? A Southern Confederacy from the get-go in 1788 and 1789 that over which the North, you know, the United States of America that excluded the South would have had no control? Was disunion? going to be better because disunion was still going to have slavery, right? Slavery pre-existed the founding. Slavery was there. Slavery was a constant. Slavery was not invented by the founders. Slavery was a condition, a reality that they had to deal with. And I think the constitution that they created was an improvement of such importance and magnitude upon the conditions that they were confronted with, upon the state of the world that came before, such that if I were living in 1789, I would be bound by that constitution. If I were a slave in 1789, I don't think I would be bound. 
by it because it obviously doesn't successfully balance my self-government and liberty. And of course, the slaves had every right to revolt, every right to revolt. But otherwise, the Constitution has to be judged by the principles uh, uh, of its time. And if it was still, if today's Constitution was still that Constitution, sure, we shouldn't be bound by it. And let's change it. Let's have judges do it. Great, Josh, what do you, um, thank you very much, Alon. Um, what do you think on the topic of, of binding? So the oath debate is somewhat tangential to this. Um, and I, I, I'm almost bemused at just how much attention it has gotten. Um, you know, I remember when I was in law school, um, it, it seemed kind of like a very, very nerdy, esoteric side debate uh, within friendly originalists, kind of just debating one another. So I mean, it's, it's very funny to me to see uh, you know, Cass Sunstein writing Bloomberg columns about this now and, and, and this debate of all topics somehow making uh, seemingly national headlines. Or maybe, maybe not actually national. We, we may all just live in a, in a bubble on this webinar, which is probably true to one degree or another. Um, but uh, in any event, um, e e look, I mean, e in my initial essay, in my response to, uh, to Adrian, I, um, you know, I, I advance some of these <laughs> oath, oath theory claims. I mean, I guess I'm basically a weak oath theorist. Um, I, 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 I am not fully persuaded um, uh, that that the words of this constitution in Article Six require um, what today we would call original public meeting originalism. But what I am more confident about is that when you take that solemn oath of office, so help me God, um, to this constitution, and you know Chris Green of Ole Miss Law School, Elon just mentioned him. I, th I do think he's made some very important points on this. Um, if you look back at the Constitution, there are some pretty clear indications in there that uh, this Constitution was referring to a specific time and place. And of course, the uh, the importation of, of slave clause with respect to uh, 1808, they mention an exact year. Um, that's a pretty telltale giveaway that the words this Constitution probably do refer to what was drafted at that time. Because today, even today, when you take that oath, you're taking an oath to a document that has the 1808, that year, right smack in there. Um, so there are some clues in there. Um, and, you know, more generally, it seems to me that Michael Stokes Paulson is onto something more broadly. And this kind of gets back to what I was saying during our first roundtable of remarks, um, that the very idea of Britain constitutionalism um, entails a hermeneutical, exegetical inquiry um, into understanding what was ratified at that time. Again, that, that does not strike me as a particularly broad or crazy claim. But, you know, there's something else here. You know, I mentioned kind of inheriting the common law tradition on the last time and, you know, my kind of anglophilia if it's not bursting through the scenes more generally. Um, but along with something that's really important here, even before the Constitution, in the English constitutional order and common law judging, this was not kind of a continental Hegelian Germanic approach to the law. At, at common law in England, even though there was no written constitution, judges thought that there were quote right and quote wrong answers. They did. And the way that they obviously discerned that was through kind of the you know empirical common law tradition, which was ultimately rooted as you know no uh, conservative icon lesser than Emmett Burke told us repeatedly, that common law tradition was ultimately rooted in the higher axioms and, sub and subsidiary principles of natural law. Um, with respect to slavery and, you know, obviously that being kind of the original sin, uh, and it's kind of, uh, you know, 1619 project and all of that, you know, look, um, I, I, I always think of this similarly to um, how Abraham Lincoln thought of it. Uh, Lincoln quite famously said that um, the Constitution was just the frame of silver uh, and the Declaration was the apple of gold to go within the frame of silver. Now, when Abraham Lincoln responded to uh, Roger Taney's monstrous decision, the Dred Scott case, by vowing not to enforce it except for Dred Scott himself. Um, and he actually issued passports to free blacks in the territories in direct contravention, of course, of Dred Scott. He was appealing to those axioms or subsidiary principles of natural law. He was appealing to the Declaration of Independence. Um, you know, and, and as a positive law matter, it's obviously true. Um, that it didn't take until the ratification of the 13th Amendment to formally eradicate that horrible, horrible, horrible stain from our constitutional order. But it was these pleas to the natural law. Um, and Lincoln didn't just do it in Dred Scott. He actually had very similar rhetoric with respect to the Fugitive Slave Clause. He, he chose to interpret that clause um, in light of the natural law. I don't have the quote in front of me, but it's, it, it, it's pretty revealing if you, if you look into it. Um, and that tradition of natural law undergirding how we think about the Constitution, how we ought to interpret the Constitution, is what I think I'm trying to get here and what I'm calling common good originalism more generally. Great. Thank you. And um, last but not least, Frank, um, okay. I realize you've taken some arrows on it. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, well, great. Uh, I'm sorry if I let people start talking about the oath debate, which I find entirely uh, without merit. Um, the problem with the oath debate, to the extent it's a debate, is it tries to sneak in an idea about the content of the Constitution, right? Uh, what they want to say is you violate the oath if you don't support this particular Constitution. Well, look, there are plenty of different constitutions out there. So the oath debate doesn't get us very far. What I wanted to say was, in opposition to what Elan had said, is I was bound by an oath, or one being born in America is bound as a natural born citizen. And it merely to make the point that you can't very much, you can't put any normative weight upon that, unless you think the constitution is absolutely so horrible that you have the right of revolt. Um, second point, look, um, originalism is simply a canon of interpretation. And if it applies, it applies generally, not just in one country and not in another, and not just in one time and not in another. And therefore, it applies with respect to the Fugitive Slave Clause um, for, you know, 70 odd years, 1789 to 1865, right? Um, the 1619 project um, is not entirely without some historical basis. If you read people like Alan Taylor or Simon Shaman, you try to figure out who was on the right side in 1776, then I think it's a rather more complicated story than many people think. But I would say this of the 1619 project, that it's so inconsistent with any idea of reverence for the country you live in, that it's wholly destructive of nationalism. Why, in short, were that project correct? Why would anyone want to live in so infamous a country as America? It doesn't make sense. Lastly, on public meanings, I, I wanted to argue for the necessity of buying into um, the intent theory. That is that what matters is not just the words, but the meaning that, you know, that, that the framers would have given to them for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it's this, look, this is what Blackston recommended and the framers read Blackston. Uh, moreover, many of the framers, four of them ended up in the Supreme Court, Wilson, Rutledge, Patterson, Ellsworth, right? They didn't have to think too much about public meaning per se, right? The, uh, the intent of the framers was built into the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court from the very beginning. Think of it as something like apostolic succession. And finally, the problem of originalism in one country. I mean, originalists roughly seem to subscribe to the we are Klingons theory of comparative constitutional law. We don't have to pay attention to other constitutions. But I think you do, because as I say, you can't have originalism at one time and not another, originalism in one country and not another. So what do you make, therefore, of um, Section 9 of the British North America Act of 1867, which vests the executive government and authority over Canada in the Queen? So the public meaning of that is pretty clear. The public meaning is that Queen Elizabeth should be ruling Canada pretty much the same way that Charles I ruled England. That is obviously not what the Fathers of Confederation wanted. So, you know, looking at that, it seems to me that the intent of the Fathers trumps whatever the public words are. Our problem with originalism, in short, is the tendency to see it as specifically applied to one period of time and not another, to one country and not another. That's not how you do canons of interpretation. You don't have an eustum generis rule for Canada and not for the United States. You don't have an eustum generis rule for 1800 and not um, you know, 1865. It doesn't work like that. You have to buy the whole darn thing. And I don't do it. Can I? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Jump, in, j jump in there for a second. I mean, there's Please. a lot still to respond to, but I know we want to get to questions. Um, so I'll just respond to this one country problem. Like, there are plenty of other countries that have written constitutions that aren't originalists, and therefore originalism can't be right. I think that's cr a crazy argument. 
Okay, originalism, uh, Frank, I disagree, is not actually a canon of interpretation. Originalism is a theory of law, okay? It is a theory of where law comes from. It is a theory of what law binds us. It is a theory of what are the legitimate sources of law. Even in, as I said, okay, even in those countries like India or Canada that have ostensibly written constitutions, but that judges, you know, do whatever they want with them, right? Something commands people or legal officials to not do things, to do things, and those T texts are given the original public meaning, right? Because they're instructions. It just happens to be that they interpret the judicial opinions with the original public meaning of the judicial opinions to figure out, okay, what does the judge tell me to do? What is the law here that the judge is saying or creating? So it's a theory of law. If a country wants to have, if we want to have a written constitution that judges kind of sort of look to as sort of a general guiding principle, but ultimately they're allowed to deviate if they want, fine then that's a legal system where we'll give original meaning to some other texts, the judicial opinions. And that's just, again, it goes to the question of what are the legitimate sources of our law and our legal system? What the judges say it is, or what we the people say it is through congressional enactments and the constitutions uh, that we ratified. So I, I, the fact that other, other countries have different theories of law, of what, what's binding the law and where law comes from, well, America is exceptional, as we always say, and I've always thought in a good way. Great. Well, why don't we, um, I'm going to ask one, I'll ask one more question while folks are queuing up, but we can go ahead and open. I see the chat box is open, so feel free to submit questions by chat, or if you want to raise your hand, um, April will call you, follow you, and, and we can activate your microphone, and you can ask your question live. Um, but while folks are queuing up, one, one final um, question for the panel um, that I'm curious about is, it, you know, one of the things that Justice Scalia used to say about originalism and the reason that he preferred it as an interpretive methodology is that was precisely because it did not dictate a particular outcome in a particular case. So you know, he would often talk about, for example, um, he thought um, the Crawford line of decisions regarding the confrontation clause was dictated by the original public meaning of the Sixth Amendment, um, even if he didn't like the results in those particular cases. And and so he would often pair that with, with, with by saying that the judge who likes the results in every decision that the judge reaches is not a very good judge. Um, but it strikes me that a lot of what Professor Renewal and some of this discussion about the common good um, is really getting to is, um, as I guess Randy Barnett in, in contributing to this discussion has called um, living constitutionalism of the right. That is that, um, that judges or academics or lawyers um, are injecting into the Constitution now things that really have nothing to do, like as soon as we move past the original public meaning of the document as it was adopted by the people, that it's um, sort of the, the wild, wild west and we can put into it whatever our conception is of of the common good. Isn't that, and is that better or worse than than the original, as Professor Vermeule put it, the, thing, the original originalism um, that seemed to be his foil? So I'm curious about your thoughts about um, what happens when we move beyond um, understanding the document um, as was originally I'm adopted. Uh, I, I could take that. No one else does. Sure, sure. go for it. Um, yeah. So look, I uh, I think that, that I, on the extreme, on one hand, you have kind of this pure positivism that is you know most frequently associated with Judge Bork, Justice Scalia, um, and kind of an earlier generation of originalists, and that's kind of what we heard there. You know, in that quote, I mean, Scalia, I think, used to joke. That he had a stamp in his chambers where he would like stamp a you know a, a lower court appeal and say stupid but constitutional right so I mean his entire kind of jurisprudence was ultimately undergirded by this belief that a judge who always reaches his or her outcomes um, is probably not judging correctly and there obviously is something to be said for that you know I since this whole conversation started I've tried to um, I, I've actually myself thought about whether there are cases that um you know I just like abhor the policy outcome but. Uh, thing came out, uh, you know, the opposite way of my policy. Um, you know, and, and I think back to the Scalia versus Thomas uh, divide in Gonzalez versus Reich, the uh, the marijuana case uh, out in California, if I believe it was. Um, and you know, I look if, if I had my druthers, if you know, as, as, a, as a common good centric conservative, I would ban every narcotic in the country, full stop, uh, like period, like no exceptions whatsoever. Um, I nonetheless think that Justice Thomas's dissent in in the Reich case is almost assuredly correct and is reconcilable. Uh, unnecessary and proper clause grounds with Marshall and McCullough. Um, so I, so all that to say, kind of a roundabout answer to you, Judge Oldham, I do think that that um, is correct. I guess the claim that I'm, you know, and I'm still fleshing this out, what I'm trying to call this kind of new subgenre of common good originalism, and by new subgenre, I'm kind of 
trying to lay claim to kind of the common law Burkean Hamiltonian tradition of thought is that when originalism does not necessarily always provide one answer, but when it narrows the bandwidth sufficiently, and it, when, it, when, when the interpretive bandwidth is narrowed such that there is a much narrower, narrower stream or whatever you want to call it, of plausible outcomes, then perhaps we should look at the preamble and look at the fact that the, that the overwhelming majority of the substantive normative reasons that we are informed for this ratification of constitution are what I would call in today's terminology, common good oriented terminology, then within that originalist interpretive bandwidth of possibilities, we ought to then normatively kick in and perhaps err on the side of the common good over maximizing individual autonomy at the expense of individual, individual autonomy. And that kind of does get back to political theory. So I actually do ultimately disagree a little bit with Frank. Um, I have never thought that constitutional law and, and, and politics or political theory can ever be truly severed from one another. Um, we are talking about the ultimate goal here of crafting a charter uh, for for generations of of human beings. And, you know, Jefferson famously used to say that the Constitution was around for, you know, 15, 20 years and they would just rewrite it. That's not a particularly conservative approach to the art or the craft of writing a Constitution. Um, so I, this entire enterprise, in, in my mind, is inevitably intertwined with politics to some degree. Um, and I think Adrian is onto something when he says that. Um, what I've tried to do and what I would encourage others who are listening to, to, to think about in their own capacities is to try and find some sort of middle ground position uh, between accepting that basic human truth that interpreting a text cannot avoid the underlying moral questions embedded therein, and on the other hand, staying true to our Anglo-American tradition, again, as I said in the previous segment, going back to common law judging absent a written constitution, of interpreting law and making law where there is such a thing as right and wrong answers. That is, those are the two things that I, I, that I am trying to, uh, try and find a, a neat solution to, and I would encourage others to try and do the same thing. Great. Uh, Frank, did you want to go next? Yeah, a short one. So, so that's what you were saying, Josh. Okay, now I understand. Um, I think I'll agree with Elan here that common good theories are a theory of politics and not of constitutional law that it's really we're, what we're really talking about is what the legislator or the executive should be doing in these circumstances. Um, I don't want to get into Vermeule, who's both attractive and repellent, and who I faulted for not paying sufficient attention to um, the origins of his religion, actually. I th I, I'm a fan of uh, Sir Larry Seidentrop's book, Inventing the Individual, and think that modernity was invented in AD 30 and that the roots of individualism and democracy can be found uh, in uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition. So, uh, but one thing that's amusing about all of this, look, I, I, I began when there was something called the crits. And these were people, very left wing, who wanted to attack all the assumptions behind the bien pensant law of the time. And now there are crits also, but they're right wing crits. I find that amusing. Uh, can I say one last thing? Super, super short. Um, yeah, of course. I, I, I agree with Frank on this general point, Josh, uh, that again, the, the common good mostly plays a role by allowing, right, the Constitution allows us through the realm of democratic politics to have, you know, libertarian results, conservative results, liberal results, progressive results, you know, few, some things are off the table, but most aren't. Right. And that's where the battle for the common good is had. But that's not to say it has nothing to do with whether the Constitution itself is legitimate. Obviously, my argument about self-government and liberty, right, that's a conception of the good, too. Right. It's just a much lower threshold. Right. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be utopia. It has to do this balancing of self-government and liberty, even if you don't think it's perfect. And then let us play out for the common good down the road through ordinary law and democratic politics. So it plays it at both levels, ordinary politics and constitutional politics. But it's much less demanding at the level of constitutional politics. Great. Um, thank you very much for, for the wonderful discussion so far. Um, April, do we have anyone from the audience to participate? We do. And just as a reminder, if you're joining us by phone and you'd like to dial in with a question, hit star nine. We've already got a number uh, in the raised hand Zoom queues and in the chat. So we will try to get to as many as we can. Uh, we've got to stop at 1.30, but we'll field some questions until then. Um, Michael Massengale from the Houston chapter, you're up. Uh, 
Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Well, thanks uh, for this really stimulating debate. And uh, uh, Josh, I wanted to particularly compliment you for uh, getting Professor Vermeule to engage with you. Uh, I've been grappling with uh, a lot of the same things that, that you've been talking about. And, and I wonder, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat uh, mystified why uh, he's perceived as such a threat uh, so as to instigate panels like this. And uh, so I wonder, would you agree it's fair to, to characterize Vermeule's arguments as essentially bypassing this debate that we're used to having about interpreting a written constitution and he's instead driving towards uh, a more fundamental legal or constitutional reform. Uh, and, and if that's right, can't, can't one sympathize with Vermeule, but still embrace and, and advocate originalism as the superior framework that lawyers and judges who have the job of trying to resolve particular disputes, uh, it, it, the best tool for them to use uh, and, and, and understand Vermeule's contribution basically as a philosophical argument about the government we ought to have rather than, than an argument about the government that we do have. So uh, good to hear for, from you, Justice Massengill, first of all. I hope you're uh, well and safe amidst this terrible mess. Um, so I think there's a lot to be said for what, for what you said there, obviously. Um, you know, Adrian, uh, politically speaking, uh, is, a, uh, is an integralist, right? I and mean, this is no secret. He has written this uh, numerous times. Um, I, I think his ideal political form is, is, is a Catholic monarch. I, again, he's written that. That's not, not like an open state secret or anything like that. Um, and that kind of obviously has uh, perhaps some substantive effects on his uh, thoughts on the, on the administrative state and uh, uh, various other parts of his constitutional theory. Um, I do think that he is ideally advocating for a new form of government. Um, I don't think that's a particularly shocking insight. I think most people who read his essay um, would come to the conclusion that his ideal political order is not one that was necessarily the founder's vision. Um, and I do think that for those of us who, as a normative matter, generally think that the framers, by and large, got it right, which has been my stance my whole life. Um, that's part of the reason I joined the Federal Society as a first-year law student at the University of Chicago Law School. Um, for those of us who normatively believe that there are truths about, about human nature, you know, to get back to Madison, Federalist 51, ambition must be made to counteract ambition, all those good sound bites, that there are fundamental generational truths going all the way back to Aristotle and Plato and whatnot, that the framers, by and large, were able to encapsulate and distill into our written charter. Um, we do have some sort of an obligation to be faithful um, to that text. Um, the higher level debate which I think has undergirded the entirety of this webinar. It, it, it's kind of uh, lurking in the background, I think, of your question, Justice Massengale, and is really lurking in the background um, of this entire national discussion that Adrian has helped launch, of course, is what is law? And, you know, uh, Adrian, I, he, he has a, a certain fondness for uh, Schmidt and, and, and various other thinkers of the Germanic legal tradition. Um, I think the Germanic legal tradition, continental European views on what is law uh, as an underlying interpretive enterprise, does differ substantially from the Anglo-American tradition. And, you know, as we've said repeatedly on this panel, I think it is an Anglo-American conception of the law to think of the law as having, generally speaking, right and wrong answers. And that was true at common law. That's true in our constitutional interpretive uh, confines today. Uh, that is different than what Adrian has put in his essay. And, he, you know, he'll have to flesh it out, obviously. I, I entrust that he will. Um, but that ultimately, at a 35,000-foot altitude level, is what's really going on here, I think. There is an Anglo-American conception of the laws having right and wrong answers, and a more continental European, really centering along Germanic school of thought of what law is, as not necessarily being tied down to right and wrong answers, per se. Great, either Frank or Alon, anything to add? Great. Um, April, should we take another one from the audience? Yes, Gideon Lazar. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. All right, so I just wanted to thank you guys for having this excellent panel. I think this was a great discussion. My question is to Josh Hammer, I have a lot of friends, and I'm fully in agreement with you, but I have a lot of friends who are much more in line with Vermeule's position and say, look, 
You know, we tried this whole originalism thing. We gave it a shot. We had, as you said, for example, the last generation of the Federalist Society was much more socially conservative than the current one. And so we tried it, but you know, it failed. We still have Roe v. Wade, and now we're having Drag Queen Story Hour. Soon maybe we'll have something like legalized pedophilia, you know, what's coming next? And so ultimately they say, we gave it a shot, it's failed, let's try something new like for mule strategy. And maybe in an ideal society, we could have something nicer where we can have this nice constitutional system. But right now, stuff has just gotten so crazy that we need to do anything that will work to save the common good. Yikes. Yeah, no, look, um, I hear that. I hear that loud and clear. You know, I was having a chat five or six years ago with a uh, with a friend who I uh, will not uh, out him on this uh, national webinar, but, you know, Harvard Law, Fed Sock, uh, multiple appellate clerkship, close friends. Um, and he, we were talking this five or six years ago, and he was already on what I'm kind of uh, going to call cynical, nihilistic originalism, uh, basically just saying, uh, the left is already doing this. Why are we trying to tie our hands behind our back? Um, and, you know, look, if, if we're looking objectively at the history, uh, you know, the post-1982, post Federal Society founding Supreme Court era history, it is a history over and over again of, um, of the liberal bloc on the court voting in lockstep with one another. They know where their bread is buttered. They have an inherently outcome-oriented jurisprudence. And all it takes is for them to kick off one uh, Republican nominee, and we've seen it over and over again how that plays out. It generally does not redound to the interests of, uh, of conservatism. And generally, you know, I would argue does not redound to the interests of, a, of America's constitutional order. Um, I guess what I would plea uh, to you, Gideon, and I uh, hope, hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, to, to tell your friends who are kind of already um, in Adrian's camp, um, perhaps you, you can think of like what I'm discussing in, in the conversation that I'm trying to launch um, as perhaps one final effort. And I want I, I hate to frame it in like that kind of dire, stark, cynical terminology. Um, but I don't think this ship has sailed quite yet. We really have kind of gotten unmoored, which is obviously something that I talked about in, in our first round of discussion here. Um, but it is not too late within the confines of originalist discussion to get back to some of the overarching issues that animated the Federal Society's founding. And the best part about this is that it's right there. All we have to do is go back to what Hamilton, Marshall, and Story, uh, Joseph Story, and his famous commentaries of the Constitution. It's right there for us. It's just not taught in constitutional law curricula in law schools. And people don't realize it's there because we've been told for 20 years now that to be a good originalist, we need to necessarily agree with Jefferson and Madison and all the various modes of quote unquote strict constructionism. So the roots for a, for a moralistic and natural law based originalist interpretive enterprise are there for us. So I would just encourage you to tell your friends to not cynically lose hope quite yet. Can I jump in there, Judge Oldham? Um, so uh, I guess, you know, the thrust of your question, you know, it seems to be um, actually something that Frank touched on uh, when, when he was attacking, if you will, Roger Pilon, which is, look, he gets, you know, if he can't win democratically, then they say the Constitution requires uh, their preferred policy preference. You know, this, and this is true of many libertarian uh, originalists. And it's certainly, you know, if, if, if your method of constitutional interpretation always leads to happy endings, as, as they famously said of, of Ronald Gorkin, then there's probably something wrong with it. And it's what the progressives do, right? I mean, the progressives don't care about democracy. They only care about democracy to the extent that they expect to politically win through democratic outcomes. And when they don't, they prefer judges uh, to take things out of the democratic process, like on abortion, same-sex marriage, and so on. The originalist position, I think, you know, call it conservative. I don't know. It's not conservative, liberal, right? It's that all these questions play out again in the field of democratic politics. So drag queen story hour. I mean, you know, that's a cultural battle, you know, fight with your local town library, you know, but the constitution certainly doesn't prohibit a private organization from having drag queen story hour. It certainly, I don't think it prohibits a public library from doing it if the town wants that, if that's their moral values, right? So this notion that, you know, the Constitution has something to say on those questions 
uh, in the direction of this common good Catholic integralism kind of approach is a very, very, very scary notion. This notion that, well, you know, if we can't win democratically, then we'll get our judges to do it. That might work for you for 10 years when the stars all align and your judges are in control and, and so on. But it's very scary in, in most in most times. And, and Frank, I think you wanted to jump in too. Yeah, a little bit. I'm, I'm agreeing so much with Glenn that I'm beginning to have uh, to, to be beginning to worry about myself here. <laughs> uh, I think part of our problem here is that terms like common good or, in, or even liberalism are so poorly understood. And let me give you an example. Uh, I grew up in what was a completely integralist society, um, uh, entirely Catholic, entirely French Canadian, but for me. And at one point when in school, public school, the nuns, yes, that they were nuns, talked about Joan of Arc. The nun took me aside afterwards to explain that she meant not to embarrass me because I was an Anglo on the subject of Joan of Arc, even though the English had uh, burned her. And from her, I learned a different kind of liberalism, which is a, really quite a, not well known. It's a liberalism of courtesy, of sensitivity, of a sense of the possibility of self-deception, things which seem to me to be entirely absent amongst some of the common good theorists who are the noisiest amongst us. There's that kind of liberalism which has nothing to do with John Locke, but which seems to me much more important and much more worth preserving than any kind of theory. No great thing ever emerged from a theory. Great. Um, well, Frank, while we're on this various topic, why don't we, um, I'm going to grab a quick question out of the chat because um, we talked about Christopher Green, who a couple of times earlier, and um, he's also in the, in the, the chat. And he, he asks a question about, um, Frank, when you were taking your oath on tax day six years ago, um, what you understood the, con the quote constitution in that oath to mean. Um, so if it's not the original public meaning of it or some form of originalism of it, um, how did you personally understand um, the concept of, of the direct object of growth? Me, personally, mm -hmm. on tax day 2014, I thought it referred to the Constitution as the courts were interpreting it at the time, as you indeed would, Judge Rule. <laughs> Very good, thank you. Um, April, do we have anybody else in the... Um, I'm happy to go back to the chat room, unless we have others in, in the queue. Yes, actually, we have quite a few. And so I'm oh, sorry if we don't make it to everyone. We've got uh, a number of folks in the line. Um, Catherine Eschbach. Hello. Thank you all for a very stimulating debate um, or conversation. I understand the terminology attached to this was itself a conversation. Um, I was wondering to what extent do we think this conversation is premature? Are we giving up on the originalism experiment just as it's coming into its zenith? You know, we President Trump just put a whole bunch of new judges on the bench who have grown up in the Federalist Society, in these conversations about originalism, and they're just getting started. And we're just getting to see what a judiciary that has larger numbers committed to originalism looks like and what that results in. And whether we're in some ways putting the cart before the horse before we see the fruits of all the academic labor of the people who have laid the groundwork for originalism over the past 20, 30 years. I'll just say I agree with that. And, and you know, I think Josh in passing, you know, said the ship hasn't quite sailed or I don't remember exactly uh, what you said, but uh, I don't, it may be in response to that in the previous question. Um, I don't think we've really given originalism a go. Uh, when did we actually give originalism Ago, I don't think there was ever five committed originalists on the court. So, so I agree. I agree with the sentiment. Um, out there. Yeah. No. I. 
Good, good to hear from Catherine. Um, hope you're also safe and well. Um, uh, I, I largely agree with Elon. Um, I, I think now, and, and this kind of gets to a higher level disagreement by, you know, between myself and probably Elon on the one hand and Adrian on the other. At, at the beginning of his, you know, infamous essay, he kind of begins by describing originalism in purely tactical, strategic terminology uh, as, as a cudgel that was wielded against the activism of the Warren court. Um, that's not how I view originalism, as, I, as, as I've hoped to make somewhat clear uh, in this conversation. I view it as a fundamental, higher level conception of law as generally having right and wrong answers um, that, I th that I think we ultimately inherited uh, from England. So uh, that, that is how I view originalism. I've never thought of it as a kind of purely tactical cudgel to kind of just dislodge. Um, the only question that I've been concerned about is developing a theory of originalism that is not just methodologically coherent, but that forward looking um, will be able to keep some of uh, some moralistic social conservatives who think along the lines like I do within the tent. And that will also kind of, I think, more authentically get back to the Hamiltonian Marshall tradition as opposed to, again, this kind of uh, strict constructionism that I think has dominated feral society discussions for too long. All right, we'll take one more from the queue here. Lael Weinberger. Hi, um, so thanks so much for a great conversation. I was wondering if I could um, just uh, ask each of the panelists to give a comment on the place of natural law and their view of constitutional interpretation. We've touched on this uh, a few different ways. Um, and for Josh and Ilan in particular, I'm curious, to the extent that you're okay with ever using natural law kinds of ideas to inform constitutional interpretation, where does it come in? Um, I can imagine uh, it could be part of the context that the public in the late 18th century would have used for reading a text. It could be a tool of constitutional construction that we only employ in areas where interpretation doesn't flesh things out if you buy kind of the um, uh, interpretation construction distinction. Uh, so there are a couple different ways you could go there if you're okay with ever using it. Um, and for Frank, um, you, I was wondering if you might comment on either that or um, maybe elaborate on your stated preference for a presumption of liberty of some sort, a willingness to see the Constitution evolve in the direction of greater liberty following the Canadian model that you mentioned. Um, I take it you wouldn't like this to be termed natural law, but in a very broad sense, this does seem to me like a form of natural law, and especially if you want a law politics distinction, it seems like some form of natural law um, or, some, or some other ethics you could, uh, has to be the um, information that you're drawing on to guide the evolution of the law. So if it's not politics, what is it? Um, and so that's a short version of what's the place of natural law. Well, they, they, oh. We'll be able to to get uh, responses from uh, Elon and Josh, but unfortunately, Professor Buckley just had to reconnect, and so I'm not sure he caught any of that. <laughs> but so I'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, Elon and Josh. Well, we'll be sure to re ask him the question though, because it, it's a good one, and and I'm tempted to say, having just watched the Clarence Thomas documentary, I have no idea what you're talking about. But uh, that was really in the exchange with with with. Um, Senator Biden, and, and it was sort of fair in response to that, uh, uh, I think. Uh, but the short answer uh, is the second uh, option, the second alternative that you described. So I've done a pretty deep dive uh, into historical materials on substantive due process, which wasn't actually substantive due process. It was something else. I just wrote a piece in Chicago uh, that uh, basically says that all these cases, antebellum substantive due process cases, actually weren't substantive due process cases. They had to do with municipal corporations or where state power came into conflict with federal power, like dormant commerce clause, these negative commerce cases. And when you look at how state courts actually analyze um, uh, state legislatures making regulations, they sometimes deploy the principles of natural law or natural right, the principles of free government as a rule of construction. What they would say is, well, look, we're, if, if we can avoid it, kind of like an avoidance doctrine. 
If we can avoid it, we're not going to presume that the state legislature intended to, to create a result so contrary uh, to the principles of natural law and natural right and the principles of free government. But they would say time and time again, however, if the legislature expressly said it, then we do it. Right. Uh, so the, the short answer is, you know, it, uh, it's. And so if you think the 14th Amendment incorporates something like that against the states, I don't think it does, by the way, which is a subject part of the subject of my next book, then maybe, you know, it can be a rule of statutory construction. Uh, but I don't think we can do much else with it. But I'm excited to hear what Josh has to say, because I think he probably thinks you can do more with it. So I guess there's three areas that I can see it playing a role here in. Um, you know, the Necessary Proper Clause, a clause I've mentioned numerous times now, comes immediately to mind. If you look at Hamilton, Federalist 33, as he outlines Necessary and Proper Clause, he's talking about the means ends uh, connection um, and thinking of the, of the principle as essentially uh, being a moral agent on behalf of the people. Uh, that's how he conceptualizes uh, the Necessary and Proper Clause. Um, that, to me, is a natural law-infused conception of the Necessary and Proper Clause. Um, and I think Chief Justice Marshall got that exactly right in his most famous quote in McCullough vs. Maryland, you know, let the, let, the, let, the, let the ends be legitimate, et cetera. I don't have the, uh, the full quote memorized, but um, that's where he was getting that from. He was adopting that pretty straight from Hamilton in Federalist 33. And I think that Hamilton's approach there um, in, in thinking of the principle as a moral agent, um, and, and this kind of gets back to Elon's uh, notion of kind of Republican self-governance and consent to govern in the first place, um, that is a natural law infused interpretation of a constitutional provision, um, straight up right there. The interpretation construction point, um, I, I agree with that too. Um, that's obviously a murky point in contemporary originalist discourse, and I don't claim to be uh, an expert on it. But to the extent to which I understand that I think it kind of connects to what I was talking about either one or two segments ago, which is when the originalist interpretive uh, methodology can only sufficiently kind of get you a bandwidth of possible outcomes. It doesn't necessarily get you a true clarion beyond a shadow of a doubt, one right answer, but when it can only kind of narrow the window of possible outcomes. That is when I think substantive appeal to natural law reasoning can, can and should overtly slide in to, to actual judicial opinions. Um, that is where I would encourage it and where I would expect to see. And I think we actually saw a lot of that in the first 20, 30 years of the Supreme Court. Uh, Calder versus Bull, obviously, is an example that comes immediately to mind. Um, but we saw that repeatedly in, in, in the early courts. Um, the, and then the final mode that I would see natural law reasoning kind of playing in our form of interpretation, something that I also mentioned earlier, um, is when a positive law outcome, be it a statute or a judicial decree, is just so manifestly contrary to the principles of natural law. And of course, I mentioned earlier Dred Scott and, and Lincoln's essentially just treating Dred Scott, uh, you know, like Bill Clinton would treat a hooker in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, so, I mean, like he essentially just took that and he didn't, um, he didn't abide by it by anything other than Dred Scott, the party to the lawsuit. And uh, that is a, that's a natural law appeal right there is what Abraham Lincoln did in that um, in his decision to treat Dred Scott very frivolously. Um, and, you know, what Adrian says on Twitter many times, I think he's right about this, frankly, um, is, you know, our, our Constitution is a normatively good Constitution. Again, I've said that repeatedly. That's always been my stance. But positivism can never be the ultimate appeal. There has to be something higher. If you, go, if you go back to Nuremberg, what did they say in Nuremberg? They said, I was just following orders. So positivism can never be a final appeal as a, as a true definition of law. And when the positive law and the natural law are in such irreconcilable tension with one another, the natural law simply has to prevail over the former. The question then at that point, um, it's kind of, a, kind of an intrinsic matter, is whether law as, a, 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 as an interpretive discipline itself commands natural law over positive law, or whether we are just choosing to ignore the law. And that's kind of a, a more philosophical debate. But, but at that point, regardless of how we philosophically view it, the natural law has to prevail. Josh, I, I have to jump in. Sorry, Josh. I think I disagree with everything I just heard from you. It's <laughs> usual. Uh, you know, I don't think Dred Scott is quite what you make it out to be. I think uh, the result in Dred Scott was a result of natural law reasoning, very poor natural law reasoning. It was a substantive due process case where the first, uh, you know, where the where Chief Justice Taney said that slaves were property, African-Americans were a degraded race, and then Congress couldn't 
uh, ban slavery in the territories, even though their Article 4 says Congress has the power to make all needful rules and regulations for the territories and had been exercised since, you know, the beginning of the Republic. It was a it was in, it was a natural law opinion couched in originalism that got the original meaning totally wrong. And that's what Lincoln said. Lincoln said, look, it's totally wrong on the merits. It's what Benjamin Curtis said in dissent. It's totally wrong on the merits. You know, can can a, a free black be made a citizen of the United States? And as Curtis said, there were free blacks who were citizens of the states in five states the Consti- before the Constitution was adopted. The Constitution took them as it found them. The naturalization power is the power to make new citizens, not to strip citizens, right? So the Dred Scott decision, I think, was a very willful, natural law opinion. And I think what Lincoln was saying is it was wrong on the merits. And as a matter of the judicial power, the original meaning, not natural law meaning, the original meaning of the judicial power in Article 3, the Dred Scott decision was binding just on Dred Scott and Dred Scott's master. And he incur- Lincoln encouraged Congress to reenact the Missouri Compromise uh, for precisely for that reason, because they shouldn't be bound by the Supreme Court's pronouncement as a political rule, at least he said until the issue is fully settled, right? But until then, it's binding on the party. So, so I don't know. I think Lincoln was appealing to the Constitution and Taney was appealing to natural law. And with those fighting words, you know, uh, I'd love to hear your... What you have to say about that, but I know we're running out of time. And yeah, I'm happy to respond or, you know, four minutes. Later. Josh, why don't you go ahead if, if you want to, and if Frank, feel free to jump in. And then, um, but as soon as you're done, we'll, we'll ask one last question um, that I think we've had a great one out of the chat room and, and we'll, we can wrap it up. Okay. Yeah. I'll try to keep this 60 to 90 seconds um, just to, for sake of time here. Um, I, I, I guess like the highest level possible, I just fail to see how an opinion that holds that black human pe- human beings are not essentially human beings can possibly purported to be girded in the natural law and the principles that Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence. And that was kind of Lincoln's overarching theme his entire political career, of course, is that the Constitution was only the frame of silver for the Declaration as the apple of gold. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's it, it's true, Alon. He obviously, President Lincoln did encourage positive law reforms, uh, culminating, of course, with you know, the, the 13th Amendment, which the, you know, the movie Lincoln, uh, was it a Spielberg film came out a few years ago? I mean, that's all about the ratification of the 13th Amendment. So there obviously were positive law reforms to Dred Scott, but he also willfully defied it. He issued passports to free, to free blacks in the territories. Um, and, you know, look, whether that is purely a positive conception of the Article Three powers being limited to a case of controversy and litigants to do something that I have espoused for years, whether that's a higher natural law reasoning there, um, I guess I don't see those two themes as being in tension with one another whatsoever. I think that Lincoln, in choosing to ignore Dred Scott and speaking of it in the vituperative, scathing language that he did in his first inaugural address, talking about how the people would cease to be their their, their own rulers, lest they kind of uh, delegate all that all the power to that quote most eminent tribunal. Um, it seems to me that he was speaking in both both purely positivist Article Three case or controversy legal reasoning. Um, but more higher than that, I, I do think he was appealing to natural law reason. Well, let me um, let's ask one final question. I think there's been a, a bunch of these. We've touched on some of the things discussed in the chat room, but let me try to synthesize a couple of them um, and, and get some final thoughts from from y'all. Um, one of the things we've been talking about throughout this this webinar is what do we do in these hard cases? Right. That, that that's the theories of interpretation where the text runs out or the precedent runs out. Um, and what do we, what, as to use Josh's word, what slides in then and how does it slide in and, and what is the content of the interpretive methodology? Um, why aren't we talking more, um, one of our participants has asked us, about constitutional amendments, right? So Article 5 is in the original Constitution. It proposes a way um, to change the Constitution when the people decide that, that, um, that it's necessary to do so. Um, is the reason for this great debate about the so-called construction zone or the end of positive law um, or however it is you want to frame it, is it because the thresholds for Article 5 are so high? Um, is it because it's been tried so rarely? Um, and, 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 you know, we've talked a lot about the Reconstruction Amendments. Um, I mean, we, and we all, we, we, I assume we would all believe um, that those are positive, those are positive laws and things that have effectuated change in a way that people wanted it done um, rather than through judicial decisions. Um, a, a, amalgam of thoughts and ideas, um, but I'm curious for your reactions. Um, yeah, I'll take a, a stab uh, uh, at this. The first thing that I'll say is, if the Constitution doesn't say anything about it, about something, then 
it's left for democratic deliberation. That's how the framers expected we would evolve and progress over time, right? If they didn't want us to evolve and progress, if they didn't want change, they would have baked more things into the Constitution. The whole point is they didn't do that precisely because they, they believed in progress, they believed in scientific and moral progress, I think. And they expected us to sort of effectuate that and, and through the democratic process uh, over time. And they gave us the amendment process for the most fundamental of the regime changes. And that's, in fact, how we've used it to abolish slavery, you know, to guarantee equality uh, in states in the 14th Amendment, a uh, various suffrage, right? African-American suffrage, women's suffrage, 18-year-old suffrage, you know. Uh, and so for the most fundamental of regime changes, that's exactly how we use the amendment process. Uh, and the rest is, it's actually very easy to get change done, right? You do it through the democratic process. Uh, it's true, some things are untouchable, right, without an amendment, like First Amendment and Second Amendment and things like that. Uh, but those are rights that I think were essential then and are essential now uh, uh, to free societies. Uh, and so I'm very much okay with using the amendment process, uh, the high threshold for those most fundamental regime changes, and leaving change where it belongs, the democratic process. So... Uh, I've waffled back and forth on Article 5 conventions many times over my fairly young uh, legal and commentary career. I, I mean, there really are competing uh, emotions at play here. I mean, the, you know, the, Bur the Burkean skeptic in me is here, there, and everywhere afraid of, uh, you know, uh, forces that we don't want kind of overtaking that proverbial convention. Um, but overall, I do come down on the side that an Article 5 convention um, of the states at some point would probably be good as a, as, as a matter of civic efficacy, if nothing else. Um, that is ultimately, uh, you know, I mean, the polls over and over again, they, uh, the Annenberg Polling Center at the University of Pennsylvania, something like one third of Americans can name all three branches of the government. Um, you know, we, I, I, I wrote a column last month about how the coronavirus potentially it could possibly result in a silver lining of a religious great awakening. But, you know, we as a people also need kind of a constitutional and a, a legal reawakening. Um, and that's not, not for the people on this webinar, obviously. Um, but I think I, I think an amendment process or trying to get some amendment ratified purely for the sake of civic efficacy um, could be good. And now, just just a quick note, um, and I was running out of time. Um, I, I, Elon obviously is onto something quite 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 sincere here. My conception of the consent of the governed and and lowercase r republicanism um, is not quite Adrian's. Again, Adrian happens to be uh, a, a not thinly veiled monarchist. I am not a monarchist. I believe in the separation of powers. Um, and I do share, um, just to make this point clear, I share Alon's conception um, that the democratic process is the, is, is for the overwhelming majority of time the best place for substantive argumentation of the common good to play out. My claim um, however, is that a purely positivistic, morally detached approach to the law is not only not the founder's originalism, but it is also untenable for the exact same reason that asking a news reporter to be politically neutral is untenable, because it is a lie against us as human beings, fundamentally. Well, we're going to have to leave it there, I think, because we're out of time. Um, next time, maybe we can have a debate about Frank Buckley's um, internet service provider. We're sorry that he, um, he, he wasn't able to join us for the conclusion. But our greatest thanks um, to the Houston and Austin um, Lawyers Chapters of the Federal Society, April, for all of your leadership in setting this up, all the folks at the FedSoc for um, their coordination as well. What a wonderful and lively discussion. Um, and I'm sure um, that, as with all things at the Federal Society, the debate will continue. So thank you very much to our panelists um, and all of our, our participants um, in, tonight, in today's uh, webinar. Thank you so much, Judge Oldham, for leading that excellent discussion. Thank you, of course, uh, again to our panelists. Thank you for the folks at Fed. Thank you to the folks at FedSoc uh, for setting this up today. And also, we have applied for Texas CLE credit for today's dialogue. So we have a record. If you attended by Zoom, if you attended by phone, please feel free to email FedSoc and let us know uh, that you were in attendance today. And we will try to get everybody some credit for that. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>